And tonight on BBC Four, we're concentrating on Radio Four and the radically changed nature of the quintessential breakfast show. It's six o'clock on Wednesday, the 29th of August. Good morning, this is Today with James Nocte and John Humphreys. This morning's headlines, American forces in Baghdad have seized a group of Iranians after President Bush again... The President used to be a magazine programme, a light, entertaining magazine programme. It was like a sort of Blue Peter for 60-year-olds. Um, an oral Blue Peter for 60-year-olds. This story, my name is Jack Manio. I'm on the BBC. It was built round Jack's personality very much. So there was lots of stuff about booze and food in it, which were his great loves. When people say, what I really love about today is that it never changes. It's always there, it's always been the same. I mean, goodness me, if they look back to the 1980s, let alone the 70s and the 60s, I mean, the difference of the programme is extraordinary. For 50 years, the Today programme has dominated the early morning airwaves. It's presenters we love or hate to wake up to. I was a bit overawed by Brian Redhead, and I felt deeply humbled. Seems unlikely coming from me, perhaps, but there we are, and to be sitting alongside him. Yes, you take your chance. Um, you might get roughed up by, by Jim or John or whatever, uh, but it is an important platform. Within the past hour. But the Today programme has done more than just report the news. At times, it has become the news. This is the story of how a light-hearted early morning radio programme became the most talked-about talk show in Britain. We had huge audiences because there was nothing else. There was no commercial television, no commercial radio. So if you wanted to be entertained over your breakfast, you had two choices. You could listen to Housewife's Choice on the Light Programme or the Today Programme on the Home Service. The Radio Times billed the first edition of Today as a range of short items with a topical interest for the average intelligent reader of morning newspapers. The first editor believed the audience would be typically on its feet, dressing, making packed lunches, cooking and eating. Everything must exploit the virtues of brevity. I took part in the very first edition of the Today programme, which was, I think, 28th of October, 1957, and I did a piece which I called Why Not Take the Morning Off? Uh, because it was about the need for people to do shift work, which people were very reluctant to do in those days. What we were briefed on was please make it nice and light and listenable. They wanted something bright and breezy. That's what we tried to provide. In the early years, the show was divided into two 20-minute slots, split by news, weather and the religious programme Lift Up Your Hearts. The redoubtable Eileen Fowler's early morning warm-up kicked things off. And knock with the music, go. And knock and knock and down and down, up, knock and knock and down, that's it, stretch more, up, twice overhead, twice down to your sides, up, fine, can you go on like that? Up and up and down. And... To begin with, politics was low down on the programme's running order. The BBC had had a rule which was that they couldn't do anything on Parliament within two weeks of it being discussed in the House of Commons. BBC, especially, did not get scoops in that sense. They reflected the news rather than let it. We, as correspondents and reporters, were expected to be much more respectful when interviewing uh, politicians than we are nowadays. They expected to be treated almost with veneration. And spend the 12 months doing two the things. The BBC convention of the interview was like a loyal backbencher. Could I trouble you, Prime Minister, to remind the nation of your latest achievements? That was a sort of interview. And the genial voice of the Today programme was Jack DeManio. Uh, he liked life. He lived dangerously, burnt the candle at, in three places if he could. 
I've had this rather amusing card about George. I wonder if we could use that. Well, if we've got time, it's what we get. You see, this is the I would come into the studio at about six o'clock in the morning and find Jack asleep on the couch that was there because uh, he couldn't get home or his wife was going to give him a hard time if he did, so he'd get into Broadcasting House and sleep in the studio. And then you had to sober him up and get him on air by seven o'clock. You know, life was, life was fun with Jack. When you go to the barber, now you've got a particularly distinctive hairstyle because your hair is brushed forward and it's cut fairly close to the head. Well, what do you say to the barber when you want it cut like that? Well, I, I'll go up to him and I'll say, well, I like a college boy. Not too long at the back, not too short in the front. And what do you pay to have it done like that? Well, if you have an haircut, a shampoo and a blow, it will cost you seven and six. We just wanted to make people laugh and... Uh, things of no great consequence got on the air as long as they raised a smile and gave Jack something to... Uh, to harumph about or laugh about or add a little story. But Jack ooh, didn't stick to the script and so he, uh, he got a huge audience because he was so informal, so, so relaxed, so incompetent, really. Thank you very much, Tim. I'm going to interrupt. Well done. I got stuck in the loo. I'm sorry. I'm going to speak to Reg Turner. I was on the telephone at the moment about these Japanese. Reg, are you there? I'm sorry about the beginning of this programme, but I had a slight uh, little bit of trouble. That was Jack Dimani all over. Of course, I don't think uh, anybody, uh, not even Jack, got stuck in the loo more than once. Uh, but normally, of course, the famous thing was that he could never read the time accurately. And the time now is 25 minutes to 7, 8. <laughs> Past seven. <laughs> got it wrong. Everybody's waving their arms at me. 25 past eight. Seven. <laughs> why can't I get it right? <laughs> I don't know. I must get off to a nut house soon, I think. Now, this was the reason why most listeners love Jack DiManio. But I, as a professional, thought this was not on, you know. And I said to my friends, what, what is it about the Today programme? I never know what the time is when I'm listening. And they said, oh, but he's such a lovable person, which he was. They loved him. <laughs> By the mid-60s, over four million Britons tuned in every morning. No wonder the young heir to the throne chose to make his broadcasting debut on today. The papers this week have had some wonderful photographs of you sitting in a dustbin and some very flattering comments about your performance in the, the show The Revolution at Cambridge. Could you tell me a little bit about the show? I sit in a dustbin, you see, and I, I'm a great fan of the goons anyway, so I thought it was a marvellous opportunity to use one of their voices. I just come on and I say, oh, hello, 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 our empty dustbin is about taking the lids off and emptying them in the dust cart, you know, yo, hello. If you think about it, that was groundbreaking. This was the young heir to the throne as a student sort of talking informally to this old buffoon from the BBC. There was, I suppose, because the BBC felt to the royal family like a safe part of the establishment then, that the royal family felt kind of comfy with it. Uh, this, of course, is no longer the case. In 1970, the Today programme was extended to nearly two hours, and Jack was joined by reporter John Timpson. It was time for Today to sharpen up its act a little. I think once John Timpson had come, Jack did feel threatened. He was required to know things that he didn't know. He was required to listen to news bulletins that it wasn't his habit to listen to. And he felt more and more like a beached whale. Uh, and, as he told me afterwards, I knew I was in for it because I was taken out for a very good dinner. And that was the end of Jack. There was a period of great turbulence in the programme. Uh, in the sort of mid-70s. I have before me a novel written by a man whose personal life appears to be so obscene that in the biographical notes... Of the Back to the play again, the, the life of a soldier has always been rich picking. Presenters kept coming and going. They were getting through presenters like Kleenex. What about actually before you walk out onto the stage? Do you suffer from anxieties now? Some names seem to me to be just right for knighthoods, and Alistair Cooks is one of them. A name like Alistair Cook doesn't seem complete without a sir as a prefix. But now that he's been awarded... The most enduring partnership was Timpson and Robert Robinson. But Robinson had trouble juggling the early morning starts with his burgeoning TV career. 
It's always been one of the programme's problems. Who has the stamina to survive? My day used to start at 5 to 3 in the morning when the alarm clock went off. There was a coffee machine virtually next to the bed. I had black coffee. I got up and I'd get into the office about 20 to 4 and th then it was all hell broke loose from then on, really. There were people giving you information all the time, both before and during the programme. And I think the main thing I said to myself was, don't panic. To get the show on air, the production team worked through the night. When I first went to the Today programme as a trainee producer fresh out of local radio, the editor, Alistair Osborne, at the time, got so fed up with the arguments between the day team and the night team as to who had messed up the programme worst that he inaugurated for a spell a 22-hour shift from noon until 10 o'clock the next morning, non-stop. 22-hour shifts were soon abandoned, but the 13-hour night watch is still dreaded by staff. And presenters find the Today treadmill relentless. The difficulty I find is that if you've been on for three or four days on the trot, you discover that you're running on a tank that's empty, really. Just a few drops of adrenaline left. And you've got to try to compensate for that. And I confess that I've not been very good at doing it. So at some point, I'll probably come to a grinding halt. When I first joined the Today programme, I wondered how my fellow presenters had dealt with the hours. And then I opened a drawer next to me at my desk, and there was a little bottle in it with night nurse, apparently, the label saying night nurse. And I thought, oh, somebody's had a bad cold, you know, how comforting. And then I took off the top and I sniffed it. And it was night nurse plus definitely gin. And I thought, oh, gin and night nurse, that's the solution. Everybody asks, how do you manage? Oh, God, getting up at four o'clock in the morning. Oh, how do you manage? Morning. Perfectly simple. Very, very, very simple indeed. You go to bed early. That's it. You go to bed at nine o'clock, regardless whether the sun's shining, whether somebody's invited you to the best party in London, or whatever, you go to bed early. I did once fall asleep in the middle of an interview, and it wasn't even in the middle of somebody's answer to one of my questions. It was in the middle of one of my own questions. And remember, I was talking to uh, Oliver McGregor, who went on to become Lord McGregor, and he was then, heaven help me, head of the Press Complaints Commission. And I remember waking up as if out of a dream, conscious that I was babbling nonsense, and I could see his eyes rolling around a bit. And I thought, this is live, I'm on air, this is not a nightmare, this is really, really happening. On January the 1st next year, the Press Complaints Commission, which polices the, uh, the, the, uh, um, the, it, it, it what, what would, what would you say that it actually has to do, your new body, Lord McGregor of Durris? You're currently head of the Advertising Standards Authority. In 1976, John Timpson was joined by the indefatigable Brian Redhead. It was the beginning of a double act that would last for a decade. You're listening to Today on Radio 4 with John Timpson and Brian Redhead. 20 past 7, Tuesday morning, time when we normally look in the post bag, so we will, but you can guess what all the letters are about. Trade unions, writes John Phillips from Derby, are rightly condemned for wanting to contravene laws to which they object. But now it seems that some leakers of confidential information are above the law and others not. This is the most worrying aspect of this whole shabby Westland business. Brian was a, was a northerner, a bit of a cheeky chappy chap, very self-confident, and at home with hard news stories. He was a journalist, he'd been a print journalist and a brilliant one before he joined uh, the BBC. There was nobody to beat him, his brain worked like greased lightning. Um, and he had, he had a wonderful rapport with the audience. What Brian was capable of was conducting a conversation forgetting the microphones were there and talking to people. And that's the essence of good broadcasting. 
he had this great glee. He had the real newsman's glee. Uh, he used to come in in the morning rubbing his hands. What have we got today? What have we got today? And it's just half past four. There's a nice feeling about the programme when you're doing... People seem to enjoy coming on it. They don't get cross about it. And people clearly enjoy listening to it. It's surprising how quickly people adapt, though, to the short interview. You can ask, you know, you can ask seven questions in three and a half minutes and provided the questions are shortened to the point, something will emerge from it. John Timson was a bit suave, a southerner, and I suspect his politics were to a little bit to the right of centre. I think he could have been a Tory. And he was at his best with quirky items. John Timpson was cheerful, middle England, Chorleywood man. He used to be a royal correspondent. He liked the jokes. He liked the ho-ho jokes. He didn't care much about the politics. He'd do the interviews, but he didn't ever like them very much. He preferred the jokes. He had a lot of ho-ho stories, which... A lot of people watching may remember, you know, he would find funny stories in the papers and, and use them as little buffers between items. Well, now the major scandal that, as you've heard, uh, has been sweeping the front pages of the papers this morning, the advertisement by the South Eastern Gas Board recommending that to save fuel, couples should share their bath. Put a bit of romance in your bath, it says, by sharing the water. You'd be amazed how much gas you save. It seems a world away now, but the listeners absolutely loved it. You have to be getting on a bit, like John here, to remember the last Schneider Trophy race. It was in 1931. Ooh, I was two at the time. Britain well. won for the third year in succession and therefore kept the trophy. Now, if you've no idea what I'm on about, the Schneider you Trophy can race. It at the of course, age I can. Two. I can remember being born. <laughs> um, shut up. <laughs> that was a nasty shock. And the listeners liked this pair. They liked the contrast. They liked them both very much. I'm not sure that the two of them liked each other very much, though. They undoubtedly were rivals, and to an extent there was jealousy. But uh, that didn't stop them being entirely professional. And I think, undoubtedly, rivalry creates, gets people on their toes, gets, gets good performances out of people. Hey, good morning from Brian Redhead and John Humphreys. It's Tuesday the 13th of June. The news this morning, MPs have voted by a big majority... Sometimes it was more than just rivalry. Redhead would let his fellow presenters know exactly what was on his mind. I remember one morning I'd done an interview, and it probably wasn't a very good one, but Brian was listening, sitting right next to me, and I saw he was scratching something with a pencil on a piece of paper. And just as I was bidding farewell to my interviewee, he shoved this bit of paper in front of me, and on it were written four letters, F-double-O-L, fool. But to my lasting fury, I never tackled him on it. I just sort of ignored it. I scrunched it up and threw it on the, on the floor. He undoubtedly thought he knew better than anybody else and was not afraid to, um, in fact, did occasionally chip in to other people's interviews when he thought they weren't asking the right questions. It was an entirely unprofessional thing to do. This is BBC Radio 4. It's half past six and time for today. Good morning from Brian Redhead and John Humphreys. It's Thursday the 19th of November, 1987. But on air, to many people, Brian Redhead could do no wrong. It was Redhead who first coined the phrase that if you wanted to drop a word into the nation's ear, today was the place to do it. It was the beginning of an ever closer relationship with the audience. But listener loyalty can cut both ways. It's a lot of dry weather, and I think the further east you are, the bit will stay dry. Crispin Thorold, thank you very much. A man in Jordan. Well, I spoke to the American assistant secretary. You know from the minute you start to do this programme that people will hold it against you if anything happens that they don't like. I don't mean just being rude to a politician or getting something wrong, but any change of style, any change of tone, any selection of stories that they think isn't uh, quite right for the Today programme, they'll tell you because they don't accept it as a product that is being delivered to the home. They say it is their programme. You do anything with the Today programme, the audience responds. I mean, if you put a new presenter on the programme, they go berserk and there are sort of riots in Tunbridge Wells and, uh, and Heathfield, uh, as people say, here's this ghastly woman on the programme, get her off, always the same. And eventually they get used to it. Jay, the weather? Thanks, John. Well, it's a pretty good start today for many parts of the UK, and it should stay that way for most of us. People get worried if the schedule slips. Let's start. Because they know that uh, if it's time for thought for the day, they've got to run for their train, um, or, you know, the sports slot means that it's time to get the kids off to school or whatever, um, and their mornings are often dictated by what happens 
on the radio between 6.30 and 9. You ask people on our programme, through our programme, to conduct a survey of the birds they see in their garden. Now, they go completely bonkers. I mean, they're out there doing it, you know, before you're off the air. Butterflies. Count the number of bluebells you've seen this year. And the reason we get reactions to some of these things, some of them silly, but most of them not, is because suddenly people feel this programme has touched something that either moves me or makes me tick, and I'm grateful. One campaign that truly roused listeners was the Man or Woman of the Year poll, launched in the early 80s. People could ring in, write and write in uh, on a postcard, please, but it became obvious that there was an awful lot of political vote rigging that went on. I mean, you'd get tons of letters, I mean, almost literally tons of letters from the House of Commons, so people were... contenders were getting their chums to write in. In fact, Margaret Thatcher won the competition almost every year. But the competitive mood of Thatcher's Britain would threaten to topple the Today programme. In spite of the breakfast TV fanfare, Today held its own. But the cut and thrust of the 80s meant it was time to toughen up. Today's first female editor, Jenny Abramsky, brought in heavyweight John Humphreys. It wasn't going to be quite as cosy as before. I certainly was the person who said we should be about today, not yesterday. You didn't just go over yesterday's news. That what you're, you were trying to do was actually looking forward, not back, all the time. And I think that's very, very important. She made the programme very, very news-driven, more than it had been before. She was tough in the journalistic sense, and she turned the programme into a much more hard news-driven programme. Under Jenny, I think it became absolutely required listening for all Westminster journalists and, indeed, all, all MPs. And no-one was a more avid listener than the Prime Minister herself. Margaret Thatcher simply didn't like wasting much time, so she rarely gave herself time to read the papers, but she would listen to the Today programme while she was brushing her teeth. Um, she wanted to do two things at once, always. If you were uh, a minister in, Miss, in Margaret's government, you knew perfectly well uh, that she'd listen to any interview you did on the radio and probably comment on it afterward. Our relationship with Margaret Thatcher was, uh, was sometimes extremely turbulent, but she was a regular listener to the programme. And I know that for a fact because I was there one morning, um, six. 35 in the morning, uh, 6.40, and the studio producer came into my headphones and said, uh, Margaret Thatcher's on the phone. The time is 13 minutes to 7, and let me bring you up to date with this morning's big news. Mr Gorbachev is cutting short his visit to New York and flying straight back to the Soviet Union because of the earthquake in Armenia. It means, of course, that he will not... She'd heard uh, the story about Mr Gorbachev having to leave Washington early to get back to the Soviet Union because of the Armenian earthquake. And this meant that he wouldn't be able to stop in and see his friend Margaret in London. And I think the impression was that she would be very disappointed, but nobody knew what her reaction exactly was. She, listening to this, thought, well, I shall tell the nation what my reaction is. We're better than on the Today programme. We have on the telephone now, from 10 Downing Street, Mrs Thatcher, who I gather has just heard the news, Prime Minister. Hello, good morning. I heard it on your news briefing. It was the first indication we've had, but of course we understand. When there's a tragedy like that, Mr Gorbachev has to go home. Uh, anything else would be unthinkable. And then I heard later that you didn't know whether I'd heard, so I thought I'd better let you know I had. Well, thank you for calling us suddenly to find yourself interviewing the Prime Minister. I mean, normally, if you know you're going to interview the Prime Minister, you prepare for it. You spend quite a long time preparing for it, if you can. Uh, in this case, I had approximately 12 and a half seconds to prepare for it, or maybe less than that. All of a sudden, you're interviewing the Prime Minister. Uh, and it's great. I mean, that's, you pray for that kind of thing happening on the programme. But however politically tuned in today had become, some things would never change. Nick Bryant reporting there. The time is 14 minutes to 8. It's time for Thought of the Day. And with us this morning is Indrajit Singh, who is the director of the Network of Sikh Organisations. Good morning, Indrajit. Good morning, John. We all have our heroes, people who inspire and give a lead to us lesser mortals. 
for thought me. for the day is the really controversial one because thought for the day uh, interrupts the flow of the programme at a very tense time, which is quarter to eight in the morning. You're really revving up. You know, your big story is probably your 8.10, but 7.45 is quite hot stuff as well. Actually, that three-minute slot, very, very popular. You know, it comes at the peak time of the programme. Now, you can look at that in two ways. You can either say, well, it comes at the peak time of the programme, therefore we'd better put something better there. Or you can say, well, maybe that's why it's at the peak time of the programme, because people like it. Thought for the Day is produced by the BBC's Religion and Ethics Department. The Today programme has no editorial control over the slot. Good morning is the Reverend Dr Giles Fraser, the Vicar of Putney. Good morning. Good morning, Carolyn. Contributors from a wide variety of faiths are asked to reflect on the news from a religious point of view. Rivers burst their banks, houses were flooded. I woke up in the, in, in, in the middle of the night uh, and I suddenly thought of Gerard Manley Hopkins' poem, uh, The Wreck of the Deutschland, which is about a, a ship full of nuns which was sinking. Uh, and as it was sinking and they were drowning, they, they called out to God. Thou mastering me, God, giver of breath and bread, World's strand, sway of the sea, lord of the living and dead, it begins. It's a long and difficult poem, but in it, Hopkins tries to convey his sense that even the storm and the water cannot finally defeat the purposes of God. The secret of radio religion is to say what is really in your mind, no matter how awful, but not what you think ought to be in your mind, or not what other people think you should think ought to be in your mind, etc., 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 then it works, because it's such an intimate medium. A friend came down for breakfast and discovers my mother dressing behind the dining room door. Lionel told you to dress in your bedroom, he says gently. I'll remember that, says my mother, which she won't because she's 90 and can't. In the kitchen, he stumbled over... But some speakers have been accused of being out of step with the modern world. There's not an awful lot of point of saying the obvious, is there? Uh, so what I try to do, and maybe I, maybe I go too far sometimes, but what I try to do is to say something that you wouldn't expect. You, you think, oh, golly, did, did, did she really say that? Good morning. An all-day celebration has been planned in Southwark Cathedral to mark the 20th anniversary of the lesbian and gay Christian movement. Various churches have expressed their concern. Soon, no doubt, we'll have an adulterer's Christian fellowship, a sex-before-marriage Christian fellowship. I see no reason why the list should ever end. Unless and until the church comes back to God's standards of morality. This thought for the day provoked over 1,000 letters and sparked a national debate on homosexuality in the church. People used to rant about Anne Atkins, but she was about the only voice on that Thought for the Day slot, which, which actually made people sit up and listen. You want a bit more contention from Thought for the Day, so that instead of people turning it off and going to make a cup of tea, uh, they might uh, listen and then uh, respond in some way. As the political temperature rose in the 80s, sometimes today itself became the news. In 1986, Norman Tebbit attacked the BBC over its reporting of the American airstrikes on Libya. It was one of many accusations that the BBC and the Today programme were biased against the government. Now, over the years, of course, governments of both complexions have been critical of the BBC, but this is the most detailed and public accusation that has ever been made, I think, of the BBC. Why did you make it and why did you choose now? Well, I made it because, of course, there has been very considerable concern about the style of news coverage uh, by the BBC uh, from time to time. Um, and I do hope that... As chairman of the party, it was part of my job to try to persuade people that perhaps there was an element of bias at times. It is Guardian-esque, I think, that, that is the right expression for it. It's a, a rather soft, perhaps London metropolitan um, attitudes, um, which are very conventional and people don't realise they have them.
people like uh, Brian Mawinney when he was chairman of the party, uh, Norman Tebbit when he was chairman, uh, both of them believed that the BBC in general and the Today programme in particular and Brian Redhead especially were anti-conservative. There was the famous occasion when he was interviewing the Chancellor, Nigel Lawson, the day after the budget. It was a big interview, ten past eight interview. A creation of two-thirds of the new jobs are low-paid, part-time jobs. These aren't the real jobs that you used to talk about way back in 1979 and 80. Well, you've been a supporter of the Labour Party all your life, Brian, so I, I expect you to say something like that, but you really shouldn't sneer at these job clubs. Which are... And I can remember listening at home and I heard this pause and I thought, Brian's going to come up with something. He's going to stick the dagger in and he did. Do you think we should have a one-minute silence now in this interview? One, for you to apologise for daring to suggest that you know how I vote, and secondly, perhaps in memory of monetarism, which you've now discarded. <laughs> I see no cause for a one-minute silence. Monetarism... That was such an electrifying moment and such a clever moment. First of all, the rest of us sitting in the studio held our breath. We really literally held our breath because we didn't know whether Brian was then going to go silent for a minute. And I had visions of suddenly transmitters clocking off because there was total silence, which, of course, he didn't do. Nobody ever knew what Brian voted. But the very fact that he was irreverent and insistent meant that he was automatically accused, almost, of being an anti-government agent. The consequence was that ministers were... Uh, insolent towards Brian, and Brian wouldn't take that from anybody. But Brian Redhead hasn't been the only Today presenter accused of being leftward-leaning. In 1995, Conservative Minister Jonathan Aitken was angered by John Humphrey's chairing of a meeting organised by the teachers' unions and critical of government policy. I think if you are a national broadcaster, uh, you should, at least outwardly, uh, strive to be impartial and non-partisan. And once you start to uh, chair meetings organised by a political party or take overt political activities, uh, which people can say, so-and-so is therefore on the Conservative side or on the Labour Party side, I think that is um, diminishing the status of broadcasters and I think very temporarily that criticism was fair of John Humphreys. According to Aitken, Humphreys' bias was poisoning the well of political debate. When I do an interview with a politician, it doesn't matter what party he or she represents, it really doesn't. What matters is what they say. I am meant to be the devil's advocate. I will ask the most difficult questions of which I am capable, utterly regardless of whether they are Tory or Liberal Democrat or Labour or whatever they happen to be. Keeping your own views uh, private is not as difficult as people think. I mean, you leave any political views you have outside the studio. I mean, none of us knows how the rest of us vote. When I was attacked by Aiken for poisoning the well of democratic debate and so on, the uh, Labour Party, the front bench of the Labour Party, indeed the whole Labour Party, as far as I can tell, rose to my defence, leave Humphreys alone. You know, he's, he's, a, he's a, 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 a vital player in the democratic game. You know, he's a defender of democracy. The Labour Party had been in power for about four months, maybe a little bit longer, but not much, before they wrote a letter to the BBC saying something must be done about the John Humphreys problem. So I had gone from being the defender of democracy to being the John Humphreys problem in the space of a few months. Now, what happened during those few months, I didn't change. What did change was that the Labour Party, which had been in opposition, was now in power. No, I just tried, because you said I have no principle with I think you meant to say I have no problem with the principle. I'm trying to help you, Mr Rifkin. Well, you're not doing very well in that case, because I'm sorry, I get very irritated when the BBC try and invent a story out of nothing. Yesterday I said... As the Conservative no government under John Major got into difficulties, 
It was a time of rich pickings for the Today programme. The policy of the Conservative Party, and that just shows what a pretty shoddy lot you've become. So you would uh, accept that uh, Mr Major could say, I have no problem with the principle of devolution. Those words could come from Mr Major's lips. I wish you would actually quote what I said and well, then repeat what I said. Well, I have what just I said, repeated word for answer. word. I'm, my shorthand isn't bad. I just John Major's government had a majority of something like one, and it was constantly being riven by arguments, particularly over the euro, but over almost anything you might care to imagine. And also, we had sleaze, we had back to basics. This was an administration in free fall, imploding right in front of your eyes. And the Today programme at that point became the bulletin board for the nation's politicians. From the Today programme's point of view, it was utterly wonderful because uh, you had a succession of very senior figures in politics, cabinet ministers and all the rest of them, lining up to tell on, come on the programme and tell us how they hated each other or hated this policy or hated that policy. I mean, I know one shouldn't revel in that kind of thing, but, but in, I know as a journalist, it was, it was great stuff. It was great copy. So one day you would have Michael Heseltine or Ken Clark on the programme, the next day you would have Michael Portillo or Teddy Taylor or one of the Eurosceptics. And this constant battle would be fought on the programme at ten past eight every morning. It's ten past eight. If it hadn't been for Michael Heseltine, Mr Major would not have become the leader of the Conservative Party five years ago. But you won't find a single MP in Westminster who doesn't believe that Mr Heseltine still wants to be Prime Minister and that he will enter the contest if Mr Major stumbles badly in the first round. Mr Heseltine's in our radio car now for his first full interview since his campaign began. Good morning to you. Good morning to you. You knew that this, the, the key slot was either uh, 10 to or 10 past 8. That was it, when the, the people that you wanted to get to were almost certainly going to be listening. What is convincing? That is a classic trap which you pose as a journalist to someone in well, my position. Well, you raised the question <laughs> with I, great I, respect. We will know, it we was will your know. word, not I, mine. Yes, but, but <laughs> I didn't say, and I'll tell you exactly what the figure is, because I know what you'll do, and everybody listening to this programme knows. If I give you any hint of a figure, you'll ask, ah, oh, well, what about the next figure? Ah, oh, but you yeah, see, you could have... You and you're not going to get me to do it, <laughs> so you might as well stop now. But you see, you could have... No, don't stop now, because it's a waste of your time. Well, no, 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 you let, know it, and I know well, it. Well, let, let, let me just make this point, that, that you you could have merely said all uh... The Guardian wrote a leader about it, calling it the Humph and Hesse show, as I recall. They said it ought to be an end of the peer show, because apart from anything else, it was great entertainment. Which, of course, it was, because Hesseltine was, was, was the great uh, showman of, uh, of, of, of the Conservative Party for many years. It was a sort of, you know, a gladiatorial context. I mean, uh, you, you had to give as good as you got. Uh, the only way, really, to combat the attempts to trap you and make you look a fool and make you say something you didn't want to say was to fight back and if you could be funny that was also good a single currency might or might not involve and at least you'll have to admit i've got a debate going well you certainly i hope it's a slightly more sensible argue. debate than we've had <laughs> the last month or two well subject. i don't know who you're addressing those comments to perhaps to your own chief secretary jonathan aiken because he ruled it out i mean he said last week i don't want to see a single currency period and this he week. went on to say, but you never say never in well, politics. He, uh, well, and, he also went on to say, I would, I would hesitate for an eternity, <laughs> an eternity <laughs> before I came There up. were two occasions where colleagues took it upon themselves to complain that I'd been interrupted on the radio, and it was not at my request, and I couldn't understand what on earth they were going on about. Uh, my reaction when interrupted by Humphreys was to interrupt his questions if he was going to interrupt my answers, but it never put me off, and I say I quite, I'm quite capable of interrupting the questioner when he's barracking if I wish to. Isn't the whole point of the interview? As today's interviews got rougher, it was unclear if it was the programme or the politicians who were making the rules. That is absolutely As a boxer would go into the ring, so they go in for a few rounds with Humphreys and see who comes off the winner. And politicians talk about it like that. They say, I got a couple of points across. I scored with Humphreys because they were able, he or she was able to stand up to the barrage and get a couple of, if you like, government points across. This idea that, in, uh, and I know some media people believe this, that at the end of an interview, who won and who lost is a ludicrous idea. And I'm not of the opinion that the confrontational type of interview is the best. When people are interviewed, and uh, it's a rough interview, and I've had it many, many times, you're not really thinking about giving proper answers. You're on trial for your life. 
and you're dealing with the prosecuting counsel. But um, even if you are uh, tried for your, for your life, it's perfectly possible to develop a line of defence which may not be uh, lead to a greater understanding of the truth but gets you out of a tight corner. But as John Major's Conservative government endured its last years in power, New Labour began to make up some different rules. Do you think you're tough enough to cope with the sort of media onslaught that Neil Kinnock, for example, had to endure? I think it comes with the territory, and I'm entirely prepared for it, indeed expect it. Alistair Campbell, a highly successful tabloid journalist, was hired by Tony Blair. Labour had watched gleefully while the Conservative Party fell apart on the Today programme, with different people coming on, expressing different views, openly contradicting each other. And they were absolutely determined that when they came into power, that wasn't going to happen to them, that people were going to speak with one voice and that the Today programme was going to be used as a vehicle for putting arguments across, not as an arena for party infighting. Making sure that people had a very, very clear brief before they went into any interview, but particularly interviews on the Today programme because of its importance, uh, to ensure that the precise line that the party that Tony Blair wanted put over was there, lodged at the front of their brain, the middle of the brain and the back of their brain and nothing else was going to come over. The generation of politicians that came to prominence in the 90s were much more acutely aware of the power of the interview and they spent much more time thinking about how to deal with questions, what to say and what not to say, with the techniques of answering a question that hadn't been asked, giving their own view, whatever the question was. So it became much more of a chess game, uh, that quite often you would find that they had produced a defence to a line of questioning that I think in an earlier, slightly more innocent age wouldn't have been there. No politician can now go onto the media and speak his or her mind in the sense of saying, as in the 60s, even the 70s, they used to say, there's a problem here and we're not quite sure what to do about it. Nobody could possibly say that because they'd be torn to bits by a media which immediately pounced on them saying, crisis in government, government doesn't know what to do. They have, they have become armoured. They have um, brought in teams of so-called spin doctors who themselves are usually ex-journalists and who, tell, who rehearse them for shows, who tell them what they can and can't say. At first, today's relationship with new Labour seemed to run smoothly. Ten past eight is the time. The Shadow Chancellor, Gordon Brown, removes another veil today, though some parts of his taxation and spending policy will remain hidden until near the election. What I'm saying is the first question that a Labour government must ask is how we use the existing £300 billion of public spending, not how we increase it. And we've already shown in opposition how we can do that. We're going to shift money from the assisted places scheme for private schools for a few uh, to reduce class sizes for the many. We're going to shift money from bureaucracy... Now, here is an example of the Today programme being chosen as a piece of political calculation by them to make an announcement because it would have an extraordinary impact. It would be heard by millions of people. It would become the main news of the day. From their point of view, that worked. From our point of view, it worked as well, because we were the programme on which somebody important, in advance of a general election, had decided to make an important announcement. But in 1997, when Labour took power, the Today programme was in for a surprise. They're making this the issue they are. It became far harder to do the programme um, once New Labour had got past its first six months honeymoon um, because it became evident that they wished to control absolutely everything. What would happen would be we would do an interview, usually with a, uh, uh, a Labour Party cabinet minister uh, or possibly sometimes a Tory spokesman, and we would get a a faxed BA do from, from Alistair, or a phone call would come in from Alistair, or after the programme, a letter would come in from Alistair, and it would tell us that we were wrong about where we were running our bulletins, or how we'd done the interview, or why we'd done the interview. That wasn't a story, this is a story. He would attempt to tell us what to do with our programme. 
there were so many complaints that I'm sure that there is a pile this thick of letters and emails and memos from from Alistair Campbell and the, and the rest of us to the, to the editor of the Today programme. Um, it certainly reached a an unprecedented level of tension and uh, and conflict between the two. And what it tended to do was put the backs up of people on the Today programme, make them even more uh, reluctant to do things the way that uh, New Labour and you know, those of us in number 10 thought that it ought, to be, it ought to be done, and so the relationship just deteriorated. Alistair Campbell saw the media essentially as, a, as circling vultures, um, whom he had to beat off, beat back, or at least try to stop them um, picking over the carrion of new labour as far as he could. As Campbell transformed the media operation at number 10, newly appointed Today editor Rod Liddell stepped up the number of today's investigative reporters and specialist correspondents. It struck me that what we had to do was a lot more of our own investigative journalism, um, that the programme had to be a lot more rigorous about the way it did its uh, reporter-led journalism, and that in, in that sort of way we could drive our own agenda rather than being dependent either on the politicians uh, or indeed on the daily newspapers. So it was, a direct, it was a direct consequence of there being more control of the political sphere. One of the journalists Little hired was defence correspondent Andrew Gilligan, his reports quickly drew attention from the government. The Ministry of Defence didn't like my reporting very much um, because it uh, strayed from, the, uh, from the, the briefings line that they wanted to give to people. And uh, they'd always managed to live with it at the Sunday Telegraph because it was only a Sunday newspaper, one among four broadsheets. Suddenly I was on the Today programme, which is a much bigger deal, and my stories were getting uh, more follow-up because of it. And they weren't happy. He probably attracted slightly more complaints than other reporters, but certainly at that stage, I, I attributed it to the fact that he was, he was getting under the government's skin more than other reporters. Andrew Gilligan came to the Today programme with a reputation as being a thorn in the side of the government. But it seemed to many of us that uh, his appointment and the kind of stories that he was encouraged to pursue represented a new attitude on the Today programme, which was the bigger the headline, the bigger the splash, that was more important than getting the story right. On the 29th of May 2003, the Today programme featured a report by Andrew Gilligan about the government's findings on the threat posed by Saddam Hussein. The news headlines this morning. Tony Blair is going to Iraq today. There have been new accusations over the reasons for fighting the war. Before the pre-scripted report was broadcast at 7.30 a.m., John Humphreys talked to Gillingham about it in a short interview known as a two-way. It is now seven minutes past six. The government's facing more questions this morning over its claims about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Our defence correspondent is Andrew Gilligan. This in particular, Andy, is Tony Blair saying they'd be ready to go within 45 minutes? That's right. That was the central claim in his dossier, which he published in September, the main um, case, if you like, against, uh, against Iraq and, uh, and the main statement of the British government's belief of, of what it thought Iraq was up to. And um, what we've been told by um, one of the senior officials in charge of um, drawing up that dossier was that... Um, Actually, the government probably um, knew that that 45-minute figure was wrong even before it decided to put it in. It was this last claim that the government had probably knowingly inserted an incorrect and exaggerated statement about Saddam Hussein's bombing capabilities that would prove to be incendiary. None of us was aware of how big a story that was. It didn't become a big story until Alistair Campbell made it a big story. I have no doubt that if there had been a story on Channel 4 News, it would have come and gone. It was only that it was on the Today programme and that Alistair Campbell hated the Today programme so much that it became a big story. It was certainly Alistair Campbell's view that the government had to take a stand on this one, that the allegations being made were so serious, effectively, that uh, the Prime Minister and uh, Alistair Campbell on his behalf were being dishonest with the public and with the media uh, uh, over the case for going to war. And that was so serious an allegation that Alistair Campbell felt that it couldn't be allowed to drop. It then became an absolute obsession for Alistair, uh, probably too much of an obsession, took up too much of his time and distracted attention from other things. But he certainly felt that it was a battle that had to be fought and had to be won, whatever the cost.
In June, a House of Commons Select Committee launched an inquiry into the government's decision to go to war in Iraq. The Today programme and Andrew Gilligan were at the centre of the storm. And let's get to the heart of what the allegation is, that the Prime Minister, the Cabinet, the intelligence agencies, people like myself, connived to persuade Parliament to send British forces into action on a lie. That's the allegation. And I tell you, until the BBC acknowledge that is a lie, I will keep banging on. That correspondence file will get thicker and they better issue an apology pretty quick. The government started briefing the parliamentary lobby journalists. They started bombarding the BBC with letters and faxes. It was clearly a uh, premeditated campaign demanding apologies for this hideous piece of disgraceful journalism. And it hit us that the government was, was really in this uh, as a fight. During the battle, a source was named for Andrew Gilligan's report, Dr David Kelly, a leading expert on Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. Kelly had been an advisor on the dossier into Iraq's military capabilities. I have to say this seems to be inconsistent between your two statements. Would you, well, would you agree that there is an inconsistency between your belief that you're not the single source and the MOD statement? There's an element of inconsistency about how to agree with you. Sir John... Uh, when Kelly was called to appear before the select committee, he denied that he could have been the main source for Andrew Gilligan's report. Well, I watched Kelly's appearance before the select committee, and he was a man who was clearly rattled. He didn't, he said he didn't think he was the source. Um, and if you look, and, and I thought it was all over then, actually. I thought this story's gonna die. Uh, the select committee decided he wasn't the source. So it was only a few days later when he actually killed himself that the story changed and changed dramatically. Dr. David Kelly went missing on the 17th of July. The next day, his body was found. Kelly's death meant that what had been a political row became something darker and of the utmost seriousness for all those involved. This inquiry relates to a very tragic death. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I think it would be fitting if we stood for a minute's silence in memory of Dr. Kelly. On the 1st of August, the Hutton inquiry opened it would investigate the circumstances surrounding Dr. Kelly's death. Lord Hutton delivered his verdict on the 28th of January 2004. He concluded that Andrew Gilligan's claim that the government probably knowingly misled the public with false allegations of Iraq's military capability was unfounded. He also found that the BBC's management and governors had failed to respond adequately to Alistair Campbell's complaints. Hutton had dealt a devastating blow to the BBC and the Today programme. It's six o'clock on Thursday the 29th of January. This is Today with John Humphreys and Carolyn Quinn. The news headlines this morning, the BBC governors are meeting this morning to consider how to respond to Lord Hutton's criticisms. Today's newsreader is Peter Donaldson. The BBC governors will meet later to discuss the implications of the Hutton report. The BBC chairman, Gavin Davis, has resigned because of the findings, which were sharply critical of the BBC. There's pressure on other executives as well, as our media correspondent, Torin Douglas, reports. The publication of the details was, in itself, absolutely hideous. It couldn't have been much worse for us, really. And then uh, the resignations following almost immediately, one after the other, of the chairman and the director general. And we were all wondering what the hell was going to happen to us, I mean, to the programme, because it looked about as black as it could possibly look. I can't remember a time when we collectively felt, really did feel, that this was, this could be the end of it. I still stand by Andrew's scripted story. I stand by that story. Always have, always will. What's not possible to stand by was the insertion in the 6072 way of the phrase, the government probably knew it was wrong, and implying that the source 
David Kelly had told him that. That, that was the unforgivable thing. I mean, look, the Today programme, when I was <laughs> made mistakes with live interviews, of course you do. Um, it's in a live programme, you cannot always guarantee against making an error. And I think that's what the Today programme did with Gilly. It's one thing for the Times to do investigative journalism, which they do very well, and The Guardian as well. Um, and they do it very rigorously. The BBC has to be ten times more rigorous. Uh, because it's licensed payers' money uh, and because it has a public service remit. Um, so it must get it right and it must be seen to get it right and it has to get not only the truthfulness of it right but also the significance. The Today programme has survived to celebrate its 50th birthday. But how does the future look? The real danger was that we would lose our nerve and that when I interviewed politicians, in the back of my head always would be, ooh, am I um, going to upset this chap? Am I going to upset the government now? Or indeed, am I going to upset my bosses now if I'm a bit too um, tough with this person? Uh, ooh, I better, better step back from the brink a little bit and, you know. Now, that hasn't happened. Nobody, nobody has said to me, since that, um, ah, difficult days, John, better go a bit easy. Ah. The Today programme is the most popular radio programme, uh, current affairs radio programme there is. Uh, it's probably the most influential current affairs programme still in broadcasting, let alone on radio. Politicians come onto the Today programme because they know they're speaking not just to the general audience, uh, who listen to today every morning, they're speaking to their colleagues, uh, they're speaking to the opposition, they're speaking to top political journalists. Every, all those people are listening in to the Today programme. So it's a, a, a platform without comparison for them. If something big is going on, it is still the place you will get the best analysis and the most intelligent approach to the stories and I think for that reason it has an important place in the nation's thinking and understanding. We're all connected right back to the beginning of the whole thing and we all feel connected and you can't sit in this studio or its predecessor in Broadcasting House without feeling um, that history sort of if not coursing through your veins at least sitting on the table in a slightly menacing way in front of you. 57 when today was young and green it went out in two editions with a vicar in between who gave thanks for the first one and offered up a prayer that they'd get it right the second time the show went on the air telling listeners the wrong time was pretty central to the show the little hands on seven so it's no sorry don't know and it wasn't so much news as a sort of topical down your way that was the day before yesterday is today